Welcome to Field Sports Britain. Coming up, we're in Ireland at the Irish Game and Country Fair at Burcastle, County Offaly. We're in England where Mike Yardley top shot continues his series on classic English game shooting. But first, let's go to Scotland and head up a hill after deer with our good friends from Zeiss. It's getting awfully autumnal, isn't it? And that means the best of the red stag stalking season is just around the corner. The question on the lips of every Scottish estate is how well the herd survived the hard winter of 2009-2010. I'm here to find out on Inner Haddon Estate near Kinloch Rannoch in Perthshire. Um, there's certainly a number of stags, so there might be a possibility of of getting in there and getting a shot. At this time of year, what kind of beast are you looking for? Well, you're wanting to take out any kind of bad breeding animal, any well, later on in the year you see the sort of weaker animals through the rut time. Um, anything with sort of switchy tops. It's a, it's a beast that's you know no cups are hanging on the top. And it could be very dangerous through the rut time. So anything a bit pointed? Pointed in the top, exactly aye. Um, taking these kind of animals out, that, benefits greatly um, from through your herd to, through a breeding point of view, plus it can be bloody dangerous at that time of year. It is a long and squidgy tramp up the hill to find the deer. The hills above Loch Rannoch are known as some of the wettest places to walk in Scotland. However, it's not going to be as hard for Craig counting the deer as it is for other hill keepers. He is a Zeiss Pro Stalker and going onto the hill with him today are two Zeiss staff members, John Rigby and Denise Frank. They have brought with them among the best telescopic equipment available to stalkers today, including Zeiss's new spotting scope. I wanted Craig to have a go on it because he talked to me about uh, whether we were going to do a telescope, um, you know, a bit like the, the, the Gray's draw tube. Now we won't do a draw tube for the very reason that it creates a vacuum, sucks in pollen and particles of dust and you can't make it waterproof and you can't put nitrogen in it and, and so on and so forth. So we've come up with it. It, it. it is shorter. You have to get used to using it, using a stick or using something to rest on. But once you get used to using it, it it's fantastic. The clarity um, and, and you know the zoom from 18 up to 45 that you can get on the hill is, is brilliant and, and I just wanted Craig to have a go and, and get his thoughts on it and, and obviously you know like help him with the cull and, and come up and see the estate. The light gathering is just it's, it's fantastic you know okay you get um, you can get some bloody awful lights out in the hill but it seems to cope with anything um, these binoculars are fit by rangefinder which is it comes in very very handy too. Oh, that's good yes. Um, and obviously the scope um, lets you know for stags from a distance in a group and also um, for, so you can pick out a, a shootable beast out of a group. Now it's quite a modern scope and I, I know there's, there's, a, there's a fashion amongst uh, hill keepers to go for leather clad old fashioned scopes, do you think this will replace that? The, the old fashioned scope you're referring to there, uh, Jerry, is that's uh, your greys or, or going to old Ross. Um, yeah, great, they're, they're, they're a good glass. Um, and they, they have a, a three draw yes. normally, and some of them have a four draw, some of their older ones. Um, but certainly, the only the only thing I would say is maybe slightly short. But if you can get it against a against a good lean, it's it's I would say better clarity wise is better than a graze. Is that because is that because you're used to pulling it out like that? Well, once you pull when you pull out, you can get you can get it over your knee or something. But as long as you've got a walking stick or something to get a good lean. Yeah. But I think optic wise, it's it's ahead of the it's certainly ahead of the graze. There's more to this than just a nice walk in the country. There's a financial imperative too. The Barclay family, who own Innerhaddon, have their own important reasons to know there is a good supply of venison coming off Scottish hills this year. Richard Barclay runs Rannock Smokery, well known as makers of fine Scottish smoked venison, available in Waitrose supermarkets, among others. Um, my father started the smokery in the early 80s. He had moved to Innerhaddon from an Aberdeenshire farm, mixed arable farm, which was relatively profitable, and suddenly realised that hill sheep farming wasn't going to sustain him and his family for very long. So um, he had deer 
which he'd culled, um, hinds that he'd culled and was snowed in. And he literally built a wooden box in the dog kennel, kicked the dogs out, built the wooden box and smoked them. Brined them first in a cottage bath, so that wasn't a very nice place to, to go for a while. Um, and it grew from there. I mean, he was kind of passionate about adding value to something Scottish, but didn't want to farm tourists and put holiday cottages or caravans or campsites up all over the place. So, you know, he was looking for a way to add a bit of value and support the estate. And 30 years later, how, how, many, how, many venison, how much venison are you doing now? Um, now, the venison from the estate comes back to the smoke in a roundabout way. It goes via the game dealer because we, we smoke the back legs only, the haunches only. So the game dealer does the, the butchery and the deboning of the haunches and then we bring it back and smoke it. But we're buying deer from all over Scotland, all over Highland Scotland. So we're smoking about 30,000 animals a year. Back on the hill and Craig is beginning to build a picture of how many stags he has left. Certainly, um, the way the snows come in, Rannoch tend to get about to knee depth of the snow and just over the hill was sort of six inches um, and certainly has taken its toll as a lot of orphan calves. Um, so we have got a better idea through the stocking season. Um, we're still finding carcasses yet and bits and pieces and you can only you can only rake the hill so much and find what you can but um, as you've seen as we're walking today we've we've come across a few dead carcasses. We did and um, I mean Rannick is always is known for being cold and so it's very wet. Wet yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. John even has a chance to shoot a cull stag but he's not comfortable with the shot. We got into a fire position um, they were they were skylined which Craig's explained, you know, there's a long, there's a lot of country behind, but uh, I, I'm not comfy with that. So my immediate was, right, they're, they're on the skyline. But also, I kept slipping down the bank. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, so it was trying to keep keep the, the, the crosshairs on the right beast, the right animal, the one with the, the, the switch uh, tops. Um, but it just didn't stay still long enough, and, um, and then they, they got a bit spooked. I can't think why. And do you blame the cameraman as well? Yes, I thought so. mainly. It's Thank your you, fault. It's my fault. <laughs> well, we can't finish without a bang. Luckily, we have Denise. Yeah. She is from well Zeiss's headquarters in Germany and admits she has never fired a rifle before. Now is the perfect opportunity to give it a go. Yeah, well yeah it is the first time. What, what was it good? It was a really, really good, a good experience and, yeah, fantastic, yeah. Will we be seeing lots of heads on your wall? <laughs> I don't know, actually, um, but um, for the first time, I think it was very, very good. Now it's off to Devon to see Mike Yardley, one of the best-known shooting experts in the country. When you're on peg, you've got to stay alert, but you've also got to keep cool. It's this thing of being relaxed, but concentrating as well. Now, when the birds do start to come, I get quite mechanical. I take my bird, find its line in the lead, bang, and then I return to centre, maybe take another bird to the other side, bang, and I keep coming back, keep coming back to centre. So you're in an ideal starting position all the time. What you don't want to get to is a situation where everything's going a bit out of control. You've got a bit flustered, you're getting out of balance, and you're in the wrong position and you're missing birds simply because you haven't made that effort to be bang, bang, back to centre. There you are, scanning, scanning the horizon for birds. Take the shot to the left, bang, back into your centre position. Take the shot to the right, bang, or whatever comes along. And you can't think about much when you're actually shooting. But one of the things you can think about is keeping your eyes glued onto the bird, glued onto the ring, the ring of its neck if it's a pheasant and it's got one, and also staying in balance, making the effort, keeping that weight on the front foot, bang, bang, for nice elegant shooting. When should you remove your safety catch? Well, you should mark your bird assess it as a safe shot and then before you mount the gun to the bird the safety comes off and then you mount the gun. You don't operate the safety catch as the gun comes up to the shoulder. And of course after you've taken the safety catch off you make sure that your thumb is wrapped well around the grip. You mustn't leave it on the safety catch riding the safety catch 
or you can end up with a painful injury. An old gun maker, Paddy Wood, he's dead now sadly, once said to me, I went into his gun shop and he watched me mount a gun and he said, oh, you're a good shot boy. And I went, oh yes, that's, this is what I want to hear. He said, but you haven't learnt to mount your gun because you haven't learnt to use your muzzles properly. And the point that Paddy told me is that you use the front arm to control the muzzles of the gun. And if you want to become a really good shot, a shot with a bit of style, you've got to use that front arm well to control the tip of the gun, to control the muzzles of the gun. And another point, we hear a lot about the mount. If you read shooting magazines, there's a lot about the mount. But actually, what we're talking about when we shoot is a mount and swing, or to be precise, a swing and mount. Because as you see your bird, the gun is moving, but it's not in the shoulder because your body starts the whole process. You're moving your body as the gun comes up. So you've got to build that movement in, and I call this the swing and mount. There you are, bang, and follow through. So you see the bird, you start moving with the gun down. You don't rush the gun up to the bird. You'll see a lot of ugly shots will do this sort of thing. They see the bird, they rush the gun up, and then they stab at it. But the good shot will see the bird, the front hand takes the barrels of the gun to the tail feathers of the bird, he lifts into the bird, bang, and takes his shot. So, see the bird, lift the gun into it with the front hand, and take the shot. And the good, the good performer looks as if he's going slowly. That's the secret of it. And he looks as if he's going slowly because he's learnt to use his body with economy of movement. He's learnt to use his, or indeed her body, efficiently. One very important subject, and it relates both to safety and to etiquette, is just what birds can you shoot when you're on peg. Now, there are no absolute rules, no absolute numbers, but generally speaking, I'd say that you don't want to shoot anything, anything below 45 degrees, so it wants to be there or higher. And if you've got neighbours to either side, again, the 45 degree rule applies approximately. But you've got to work it out when you're there on the day. We've got ground rising to our front here, so that might mean that some shots are not going to be safe at 45 degrees. You've got to use your head. And in this position, as it happens at the moment, I've got no one on my left-hand side, so I can, in fact, take birds on my left flank that I wouldn't normally be able to take if I was in line. OK, so the rough rule of thumb is 45 degrees, so when you see the bird, you can see it in mid-sky. So nothing below that, that would be too low, that's acceptable, anything there is fine. And similarly, to either side. But it all depends on the day, it all depends on the ground, and you've got to make the decisions for yourself, it's your responsibility. Don't be frightened of it though, it is all pretty commonsensical, once you get used to it and once you understand that if a bird is going to your neighbour it's good manners and sensible to let him have that shot and don't be greedy there's no need to be greedy there'll be plenty of birds for you and if you do start shooting your neighbour's birds you'll lose your name and you won't get invitations and also you're not behaving like a sportsman because what we're doing here isn't just about shooting it's about learning about the country it's about the socialising with your guns, other guns and friends on the day. And it's about connecting with this wonderful environment in which we shoot game birds in Britain. And it's a fantastic privilege and it's to be savoured. You don't need to shoot 500 birds on a day to appreciate this great tradition. Just one thing, we're standing on our peg, we're waiting for birds. Some people will have a crack at a pigeon. I never do and I think it's bad form to shoot at a pigeon until a game bird has been shot. So hold on to your ardour, wait for the pheasants and partridges, have a go at a pigeon later. You can get some fantastic shots on peg at pigeons, but it shouldn't be the first shot. Let's go to Ireland, where the Irish Game and Country Fair took place. <laughs>
Dogs are an essential part of any Irishman's armoury, so lurcher racing you'd expect at an Irish game fair. Terrier racing, that's a staple of any game fair. But children, yep, they do children racing here too. There's a serious side. The National Association of Regional Game Councils is a kind of national shooting club for Ireland. And here's the voice of the NARGC to tell us how serious. We're here because it's the biggest game fair uh, in the country. We're the biggest shooting organisation in the country and it's a bit of a pilgrimage for our members. It's, the, it's like you know, the annual pilgrimage to, is, is to the Burr Game Fair. And it's a really important opportunity for our members to be able to meet the people who run our organisation. Uh, and it's very important for the people who run the organisation to meet the members as well and to hear their views and to do it at first hand. Our entire board, in fact, is here at the Game Fair and is available to any club member. And game shooting is unbelievably popular throughout Ireland. Um, certainly in terms of the popularity of shooting in the country, as you mentioned, I mean, Ireland has, there are 4% of the population is involved in some form of, of hunting, whether it's game shooting, whether it's hunting with hounds or whatever, and that's an extraordinarily high percentage uh, of the population. It's matched only in Europe by Finland uh, and coming very close behind perhaps Sweden. Uh, if you take, for example, the UK, it's 0.04% of the population is involved in, in, in hunting. So, you know, by any standards, it's a very important to the Irish rural community and it's very important to local economies. Don't forget that the people who come to the game fairs, the small businesses, they are all small businesses. Many of them are based on very specialised skills which have been handed down from generation to generation. There are displays of old-fashioned shooting, even more old-fashioned fighting, and probably Ireland's most traditional industry these days, tourism. Well Shannon Development is the regional tourism organisation for this area, the area including uh, Offaly, Tipperary, Clare and Limerick. One of the things that we're looking for in trying to encourage um, tourists to this area is to develop fairs such as this, the Irish Game and Country Fair, because of the quality of the fair but also because of its exact fit with the area itself. This sort of event here helps to bring people together in a shared love of the various sports that are here. The Burr Game Fair is also an opportunity for modern shooters to get together and compete in the clay line for great prizes. Well, the clay pigeon competition, it's the biggest competition of, for clay shooting, biggest prize fund anywhere in Ireland this year. €14,000 plus in prize fund and a huge organisational task done by the Darren Sallow shoot who have done a wonderful job and we have them every year and we can rely on them. It brings shooters from all over Ireland and also from the UK. We've had a number of shooters have travelled from the UK to compete in it and it, that shows the standard and the quality of that shoot and the way it's run. Try to maintain the standard as high as we can you know and from the experience we've learned from previous years obviously you know, the competition is getting higher, the standards are getting higher and higher every year. Well, we believe it to be the largest uh, open clay pigeon shoes for, you know, prize fund in the country. We also have a Game Fair Championship, which is the star competition of the show. It's for a DD10 Beretta shotgun worth 7,500. We've had a number of different people from different countries. We had a Welshman one year. We've had Irish shooters. And it, it's, it's, it's in, literally in the lap of the gods down to the last, last couple of cartridges sometimes. Clays take you one way. The Irish love of dogs takes you in almost every other direction. Oh, gun dogs, retrievers, spaniels, it doesn't matter what they are. They always draw a great crowd. Every kind of gun dog is tested at Burr Castle and in every kind of way. There are a series of competitions sponsored by local dog food company Massbrook. Tests include long distance retrieves in the national, open and international team events. We even spot owners of rather untraditional gun dog breeds taking an interest.
For the series competitors, there's plenty of water work. And the All-Ireland Game Fair Retriever Handling Champion gets to take away prizes sponsored by H&J Pet Foods. We certainly had plenty of colour today. We had some of the most beautiful driving carriages, immaculately turned out. Their, their grooms and, and, and their drivers, absolutely spiffing. Now, marvellous turnout. You, you just had to look at them and you saw class. Beautifully kept carriages are on display here from local sources, including Burr Castle itself. Burr Castle and its game fair is truly history in motion. You could see how you lived in medieval times, you could see them cooking. You could see the woodwork, you could see tinsmiths, you could see an apothecary, all something which is living history. Now, that is something you can not get out of a history book. So you can fill it up with water or beer or whatever you want. And you drink it with There's music of sorts. <laughs> and then there's fishing. Oh, fishing. Fishing with Fisherman's Row here. We have some of the finest free trout fishing in the world, which for native brown trout in the lakes in the west of Ireland, even go down just, there's a river near me, the River Talca. It's a mile from my home. It's in, it runs through the middle of the, of the capital city. And I only have to drive about a mile up the, the road to where it's still country and I can fish for wild Irish brown trout. It's justly proud of its salmon and trout fishing and its fishers. The Blackwater Lodge is one of the most famous fishing destinations in the world. And here's the woman who runs it. The game fair is about coming and trying different sports and here what we have is we have a situation where sometimes people may not have necessarily seen fly casting before or maybe they've wanted to try it and they're here today and they have an opportunity to try it. I'm doing some casting demos in the main arena and here I have the Upguy Ireland team of casting instructors with me and they're helping to run the casting competitions and also to give people a go and to um, correct faults if there's some experienced anglers out there. There's many places to fly fish in Ireland. Um, I own, with my husband, and run what is called the Blackwater Lodge Salmon Fishery. Um, so we accommodate 40 people. We specialise in salmon fishing. But the first port of call for, for a newcomer to Ireland would probably be the fisheries boards. They get in contact with them or the local tackle shops in the area, and they're very keen to put them in touch with people who can, experienced people who can take them out fishing. But not only that, um, they have the facilities that maybe hire rods and things as well. So you don't necessarily need to come with everything to Ireland. You may be the kind of angler who dashes around, leaping from rock to rock, or you may be the more sedate variety who can identify ephemera at 40 yards. Whatever kind of angler you are, indeed whatever kind of sportsman or woman you are, you'll need food. And Burr Castle has plenty of food, including an English chef. We had Mark Gilchrist uh, doing the game cooking. Uh, we tried, uh, we, our first venture into this was last year, as you know. Yes. It was extremely popular. There was absolutely no question but that we were going to do it again this year, and it's even more popular this year. It attracts very large crowds of all shapes, creeds, colors. Uh, everybody likes cooking, and everybody likes to see it done properly. Uh, but more importantly, than that it's an opportunity here for a great many people don't forget everybody here is at this fair and is not necessarily from a shooting or hunting background uh, and it's very important for people to be able to sample which is what we're doing in the game cooking uh, to sample game and game meat it's an extremely healthy food source it's probably the ultimate in terms of organic meat if you like because it's all in the wild um, and uh, people just love it Irish hawking is a very important sport, not one of the biggest sports as regards numbers, but very, very dedicated people in, in the Irish hawking organisations. And they came here today and they showed off their various birds, and anybody that wanted to know something about them, they'd tell them, and that is promoting their sport. It's the oldest form of hunting. 
and we had a UK hawker or falconer over today who did a fantastic job. He put on a great show. He flew the birds well. The crowd loved it. And hawking is a terribly attractive thing because it's action. Well, we can't leave Ireland without going back to the terriers and lurchers. Terrier and lurchers at many shows are the Cinderella's of the shows. And we've always had fantastic prizes, which Philip has told you about, for the clay shooting, the fly casting, the gun dogs, all our own interests in a way. But some friends of mine, we have been running good terrier and lurcher shows in uh, both Northern Ireland and here. But through the terrier and lurcher forums, funny enough, we got the idea of this Five Nations Championship. And Tom Chalmers, um, a chap from Scotland and Fran Booth from England, and I worked together that we would have two English qualifiers, one Scottish, one Welsh, one from Northern Ireland, and then the final qualifier at Burr and the final at Burr. But the winner, the champion, is dog number nine. So that Mr. Danny Sykes from Brown And the winner, England. he's from, from England. Four-year-old Black Pearl Terrier. The North of England dog that qualified at the North of England show. The we set it up that there'd be three the independent one judges, Mouse. one from Scotland, one from Ireland, and one from Wales, and that they would judge independently on a card system where they would score each dog out of six, and then two independent scrutineers would look at the cards. Once the judges had looked at the dogs, there was no further consultation, and they were it, the, the thing was judged totally independently and I think the result was fairly well received. We brought to Ireland now three game, good game fairs this year. We had record crowds at Shane's Castle and we followed up here with another good show. So three good shows in a year. And what we have brought to the shows in Ireland is a little bit of Irish charm and crack.